Hi, it's Alex. Uh, I know this is crazy recording back-to-back -back videos about the same topic, the election, but I think it's important. This is a very important election, and it's on my mind. Today I want to talk about mental health and the 2024 presidential election in the U.S. Now, how are these two topics related? Uh, one thing that I see is that I see a lot of people are getting very stressed out about this election. And I've read some news articles about this lady, lately that people are talking about how they're really, really worried about the outcome of this election. And you see this on both sides of the political spectrum. Like, there's unprecedented amount of worry about bad things that might happen to this country if the other side wins. And this is kind of unprecedented. If you go back in time several election cycles, people weren't quite this worried about the state of our country. Um, and it's not just that that is affecting people's mental health. I think there are a lot of other relationships between politics and mental health. And one of them is that there's a great deal of negativity and hostility surrounding this election. Uh, people have become very polarized into these two camps. Uh, and people are not necessarily thinking rationally about it either. There's a lot of very harsh, negative overgeneralizations that people are making about people on the other side. And this stuff really troubles me as someone who has myself struggled with mental illness. And I want to talk a little bit about my own experience with mental illness and how it relates to what's going on in politics. Uh, I've struggled with a number of different things over my life, and probably the biggest and most debilitating mental health struggle has been with depression. Um, I had some signs of depression early on in like high school and college, but it didn't really hit me hard until I graduated college, and I became really, really depressed. It was a difficult time in my life for many reasons. Uh, the job market was very tough. It was in the wake of the tech bubble, so the economy was in rough shape. It was hard to get a job. Um, and the, the hardest thing for me was loneliness and isolation. And that, that's not what this video is about, but I want to talk about what happened to my mental state when I became depressed. Um, depression distorts your way of thinking. Like, your brain basically doesn't work right when you're depressed. And one of the things that happens is your thought patterns and even your beliefs become distorted. And what's really interesting, cognitive psychologists have studied depression and they've studied the patterns of cognitive distortion and they found that there is a certain set of patterns that plays out in most depressed people. And uh, so it's not like everyone's thinking the same thoughts, but there are certain trends that like, it plays out differently, specifics, in different people, but the patterns are more or less the same. And one of the patterns is you get negative overgeneralizations. So something bad will happen and you'll, in your head, you'll generalize. Like, you'll, you'll do something wrong and then you'll start thinking, oh man, I mess everything up, I'm a total failure. You, you get this sort of black and white thinking or all or nothing thinking. Uh, you use negative labeling, so you call yourself a failure, you might also call other people by negative names, and that becomes like a more externalizing type of thing. And when I was depressed, I would do this both to myself and to others. I was in such a negative mindset, it was completely toxic. Uh, also, you get this pattern of a, what's called a mental filter. Your brain filters out good things, like to where you can't even remember them. Like an extreme example, once I, when I was in this pretty bad depressed state, I ran into one of my friends and the friend was like, hey, do you want to meet up later for, uh, you know, we can hang out? And I was like, sure, that sounds great. And then I got home, my brain just completely shut that interaction out and I was sitting at home sulking and I was thinking, I don't have any friends, no one wants to hang out with me, like, I just couldn't remember that interaction. And that's what depression does. Your brain operates irrationally, and it's like you're fighting your own brain. It's a really terrible thing. And when it gets really, really bad, you can get so bad you don't even really have thoughts anymore. You just feel sort of numb and dead inside. So I've been into this place, and I've thankfully gotten out of it. I'm in a pretty good place right now. And one of the things, when I started recovering from depression, 
I, I, I did so in large part by becoming aware of these cognitive distortions. That's one of the key things that cognitive behavioral therapy does. I highly recommend if you're, if you're someone who operates kind of like me, you might benefit from that if you're struggling with any sort of mental health things. And there's some books I could recommend in the comments. But basically that's the, the main tool I used to get out of depression. And when I did that, I went back to the political system and I started noticing something a little disturbing, which was that a lot of the same patterns of cognitive distortion that I noticed in my own thinking, in my own brain, I started seeing in political speech, in the, the rhetoric coming out of people running for office and people in office. And I noticed it especially in how they talked about each other. There were a lot of negative overgeneralizations. There was a mental filter. People would exclusively focus on the good things that their party had done and the bad things that the other party or their political opponent had done. People would use negative labeling. They would use these slurs or insults to refer to other politicians and sometimes even politicians of their own party who disagreed with them and often even the bases or the voters of the other party. They would like use these slurs to refer to the other people who supported the other candidate. It's really, really toxic. Um, and I found this very disturbing because I thought, you know, when I became depressed, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm just depressed because it's a hard world we live in, because I was having a hard time because the economy was rough, but you know, I had all these reasons. But when I started reflecting on the political system and the rhetoric coming out of it, I started realizing that there maybe were other factors in why I became depressed. And I've always been a pretty politically involved, politically engaged person because I care about our society, I care about my country, I care about the state of our world. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to have the biggest possible impact. So I want to understand politics and I want to make the best possible decisions. So I've always been engaged in politics. But, but because politics can be so negative like that, I think I may have picked up some of these negative patterns of thinking from the political discourse. And that was a little troubling to me. And I started wanting to do something about it. But, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a tough nut to crack. How can you change the entire culture surrounding politics in an entire country? Uh, that's something I want to do though. I'm an ambitious person, so this video is part of wanting to do that. So, going back to the current election though. So we currently have this atmosphere of anxiety, fear, and this sort of us versus them. And I think all of these things are characteristic of mental disorder. They're characteristic of unhealthy thinking, irrational thinking. And I want to make clear, these patterns exist on both sides of the political spectrum. Uh, I can't let either party off the hook because they're both guilty of this stuff. Uh, but at the same time, we can use what we know about mental health and what we know about cognitive distortions to guide the choices that we make of who to vote for. And right now we see a pretty stark contrast between the two candidates for president. You have Kamala Harris running as a Democrat and Donald Trump running as a Republican. And you know, I could, I could go on about each of these candidates. There's things I like and things I dislike about both of them. But one thing that I've noticed that has become increasingly, increasingly stark recently is that there's a difference in the structure and patterns of thinking that you see in these people's speech. And it couldn't be clearer than in the last uh, presidential debate. And I watched that whole debate, and I, if you haven't seen it, I really want you to watch the closing statement in particular. Uh, because when I, when I listen to the closing statements of the two candidates, it sort of resonated with something that I had experienced. It resonated with my own experiences of depression. Uh, Harris gave the first closing statement, and frankly, Harris was a little boring. Uh, it was kind of uplifting and positive in some ways, but it's just sort of normal politician trying to get votes, trying to appeal to everyone. And it's like, okay, this is fine and dandy. But then Trump spoke. And that was when it really kind of spoke to me. And, and not in a good way. Like I say Trump spoke to me. Trump sounded a lot like my own brain when I was at my worst moments. He was describing America as a failed nation. And he like attacked Harris as like the worst vice president ever and attacked Biden as the worst president ever. 
And, you know, like, like this is kind of ridiculous because we've had a lot of presidents. I mean, I grew up right down the street from James Buchanan, who has been hailed as the worst president ever. So I'm thinking, you know, that's some tough competition. You're, you're comparing Biden to this, this president who kind of defended slavery and maybe played a big role into the U.S. slipping into the Civil War and so on. So, um, you know, <laughs> you're making a bold point there and you're not defending it. So, like, on some level, that, that, that just seemed like a big exaggeration. And, and that, like, that characterizes Trump's speech as a whole. He exaggerates a lot. He uses uh, strict all-or-nothing or, or black-and-white characterizations. He uses negative labeling. Uh, and he uses a mental filter. He doesn't really have anything nice to say about his political opponents. And even, even the people within his own party who, who criticize him. He doesn't have a lot of nice things to say or anything nice to say about them. And I, I, I don't like that. Uh, I think it's very important to respect all people and to especially respect people who disagree with you because that's always where we struggle the most. Like, if you disagree with me, I'm going to find it a little bit harder to respect you. Uh, it's just part of human nature, and you have to fight against that a little bit, have to exercise some restraint. Uh, I'm not saying Harris is perfect, she's far from it, but I see her exercising more of that restraint, and I think that's valuable. And even completely setting aside poli uh, policy, you know, whether you're right-wing, left-wing, whatever, I think that there is a very important role for the U.S. president as a spokesperson, not just for the U.S., but for the entire world. Uh, the way they talk about things kind of sets the tone. Uh, and I think that influences people. I think that influences uh, people's mental health. It sets an example of how to communicate with each other. And I think it reflects how that individual thinks. And I think that if you see these patterns of communication characteristic of mental illness, these cognitive distortions, that's a sign that the person is not thinking as rationally and they're not going to make as good decisions. Um, and that, that's what I see in Donald Trump. And when I look at Harris and how she speaks, she seems a, a quite a good, a good bit more rational. It doesn't mean she's going to make perfect decisions. Like, I can tell you straight up, I know she's not. I know she's going to make mistakes. I know she's going to do a lot of things I disagree with. That's just the way politics are. No one's going to be perfect. Uh, but there is a really stark contrast in terms of the mental health that I see in these two people, and I think there's going to be a stark contrast in the effect that they have on the mental health of the world, uh, and especially of the U.S., through how they speak to people, through how they conduct themselves. So I hope you can reflect on that when choosing who to vote for. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for listening to this. If you got to the end, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day.